Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Common Sense Academy. I'm your host, Joe Palmetto. Joe, the lawyer. Smarty Marty with 499 Super Chat. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for joining me here today to talk about sovereign citizens, the old French flag, or whatever it is that you guys want to chat with me about. I thank you for tuning in today. Got my hat on. I got a beverage here. Um, we already got a couple of people here in the chat room. A little news, a little news before we get going and get rolling. I'm here on my laptop and I left my battery for the laptop at my office. So we're going to go as long as my computer um, will allow me to go. Will that be an hour? Will it be half an hour? Will it be 45 minutes? Frankly, I don't know. Chief Tuttle, how you doing? Thank you for tuning in, coming in. Smarty Marty, Jeff must die. I appreciate it. Anything you guys want to talk about, um, let me know. I know we want to talk about sovereign citizens and First Amendment auditors. Let's see. There was recently, I don't know how many of you watch um, Am I or follow the the Reddit page, Am I Being Detained? I'm going to do a video on this. But there was an article about P. Barnes and his years of service, his years of service as a court bailiff. Um, I, I thought it was a great article. Now, um, I'm not going to go too much into it today. Go to the Reddit thread, Am I Being Detained? And run through there if you want to check it out. But I'm going to do a video on it. It's going to be my next video. Um, it was a dedication to the man who, within the sovereign citizen community, is an absolute legend. Hello, Judy Sings, Mango, Pepsi. <laughs> it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Um, hey, OPT lawyer, thank you for joining me. Causeless Rebel, Edward Wildenhine, thank you guys. Come one, come all. Um, like I said, I'm going to go as far as I can today. My, I forgot my battery. And one thing, I do have um, a MacBook, and I like Macs for a lot of reasons. They don't break, and they have a good – I like the user interface. But let me tell you, you can't just pick up a plug from an old laptop and stick it in your Mac, okay? Every Mac has its own stinking plug. And if you don't have the right one for that generation of Mac – you are out of luck. And right now, I'm out of luck. So my computer may or may not die. Let's see what happens. Um, what is there to talk about today? Change from chief to officer for now. Wait a minute. Officer Tuttle, the country cop. Oh, I, chief, I preferred the chief. Why'd you make the change? Why'd you make the change, man? I'm curious. Um I prefer chief. I just think it's, I just like, I just like the way it sounds, but Hey, whatever you want to do, if you think that's a little better for your show and your style, go for it. Um, uh, let me know, let me know, let us know why you went and you made that change. That'll be interesting. We got to do a, uh, a crossover. So some of the videos I did uh, recently, and I got a lot of hits. Usually, I don't saw my videos where I just cover news articles, but there was the dude who opened up his pizza shop, okay? The sovereign pizza guy. I really got a kick out of this story, okay? So this guy opens up a pizza shop, all right? And um refuses to follow any of the rules. Here's the thing. He opened this during the pandemic. I'm, I'm pulling up the article right now, so I can take a look at this. He opens up this pizza shop, uh, let's see, on March 12th. I'm looking through the article here. I can't remember. We'll do the same time sip when we're about 15 minutes in, but I am thirsty. This guy opens up a pizza shop. March 12th. I'm looking for the date here. I believe he did it either in January of 2021 or perhaps even January of 2020. Um, but I don't believe it, it wasn't just that he wasn't following, you know, the mask and the COVID-19 distancing regulations, things like that. But it's my understanding 
um, that he wasn't following any of the health codes or any of the rules set out by the local jurisdiction if you run a pizza shop. Allegedly operate, operating his pizza parlor without obtaining legally required license from the health department. Now, a lot of people, hey, Edward Vildenheim, thank you very much. I wish it was a Duracell, sir. I wish it was a Duracell. What we are stuck with is whatever the freaking battery they put in the Mac. And let me tell you this, like I said, I like Macs because they last. I've had this computer for a while, all right, but uh, the batteries get weaker as it goes on. Okay, so this guy opens up this pizza shop. Let's go through here. Um, underground, owner of the currently closed Underground Pizza Network. Now, I actually think that's a pretty cool name. You know, the Underground Pizza Network. And I don't know how familiar you guys are You guys are with like ghost kitchens, right? So um, now you have these things, we have these ghost kitchens out there where people will be selling food on Uber Eats, on um, on uh, Grubhub, okay? And what they're doing is they don't own a whole restaurant, but they may be going to a restaurant and making burgers and fries and then setting up a website and, on Uber Eats and then delivering this stuff, okay? They're called ghost kitchens. So, and those things have grown more popular during the lockdown. So this guy opens up this underground pizza network. He started running it in January. I mean, January of this year, we're only in June right now. Starts running it in January and refuses to get a, a, uh, a, a health license to operate his restaurant. Now, I worked in the, re the restaurant business for a long time, so I have an interest in it. I know a little bit about it. Okay, you have to like uh, uh, getting licensed by the health department. Look, there's a lot of stuff out there, the, a lot of things that the government regulates that I think are ridiculous. Okay, there's a lot of government regulations and red tape that can hold business back in a lot in a, in a large sense. But let me let me just say this. I support fully the health department regulating restaurants, okay? Because what you are going to get are some trash restaurants and places where you go and you may end up eating food that makes you sick or unhealthy or getting salmonella or, or food poisoning, okay? So this guy in January of 2021 opens up a pizza shop, won't even get a... I, 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 a approval from the local health department. You have to get a license to operate a restaurant. Okay. I don't know if he was running it as a ghost kitchen. Maybe that was his thing. Um, it's a lot of bullshit. Well, look, <laughs> Zephiel, I'm sure that there is a lot of bullshit that has to do with a health, a health license and maybe it should be different. But I personally don't really mind there being some sort of body that oversees restaurants that are operating. Okay. I don't mind it. I really don't. And I'm not saying everything that they do is right. I agree with you, but I think there should be something. So this guy, I don't know if he was doing a ghost kitchen. He opens up this pizza shop. They start to crack down on him, fine him $10,000. He comes into court claiming that he's a sovereign citizen. He has the right to run this business without any government interference, okay? And uh, he give, he's given the business to the judge and his attorney while he's in court. Not only is he probably looking to get put on probation or do some time for a criminal offense, but he's likely looking at a massive amount of money in fines. Hey, Adam, how you doing? Hey, um, and it, it's just a, it's just a wild, it's just a wild story. You know, the sovereign citizens, we're used to them going out there and pretending to be attorneys and judges, right? <laughs> I mean, remember the guy, I think he was in Hawaii who, or, or whatnot, who was calling himself, um, a, uh, a professional attorney general and he had a whole law office. I mean, he got years in jail on a federal case. OK, he swindled tons of people into making them think he's a lawyer. And um, I, this is the first time I've seen sovereign citizens going into the food business, <laughs> going into the restaurant business. And, 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 and 
you just, again, you got to wonder what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Is this guy say, oh, I'm going to start a restaurant uh, and, you know, F the health department? Or is he saying, I'm going to start a restaurant and then he sees everything that's involved. And then he says, well, now I'm going to adopt the sovereign citizen. Like, like does he adopt the sovereign citizen stuff to defend himself? Or did he adopt the sovereign citizen stuff before he even got into the business? So that's likely going to be some very entertaining litigation from our point of view, but very annoying from the point of view of the attorneys and the judges involved. And, uh, you know, my heart goes out to them. Nice, Adam. Have a nice have a nice night of training, man, at, at the firehouse. Thank you for... Uh, Thank you for doing your duty and uh, staying on watch and uh, keeping the people of your community safe. We truly appreciate it. Um, Snake Pliskin, you know, he saved L.A. Um, he saved L.A. He's a great guy. You're a great guy, too. Sovereign citizens never think – they don't think they have to follow any laws. What hockey rink in Pittsburgh does Killer Dave Hansen run? Just wondering. I don't know, Chief. I don't know. Health licensing is a lot of bull. So this this uh, this pizza guy, man, he cracked me up. So, hey, thank you for the burgers, FIL. I appreciate um, the super chat as well. Um, what else did we get into this week with the sovereign? Okay, the auditor and the cop. So I, I have a lot to say about this, and I said it. In, I I said a lot, a decent amount in my video about the auditor. Okay. Um, this auditor goes out and he finds, you know, he sees this cop who's giving out warnings and doing a really good job of explaining things. And I don't disagree with the auditor that, you know, those are this cop. If you see this cop, you watch that video I did, auditor and cop friends. Um, I agree that he, you know, that guy, he's been doing it for a long time. In many ways, he probably sets a, a really great example for, um, for police officers, right? Using his discretion, trying to keep people safe, issuing tickets and edicts in a friendly uh, in a friendly manner. I mean, that's what we want, right? We want neighborhood policing. Obviously, that's not going to be the case in every instance, right? It's just not going to be the case. You're not going to get neighborhood policing. You're dealing with uh, violent criminal gangs or criminal organizations or or people with high propensity for violence. Okay. It's not going to happen. The police are going to come in knocking heads, and that's probably how they should. Um, but, yeah, when they're giving out tickets, they should be friendly, et cetera, et cetera. So this auditor is out here, and he's running um, – you know, he's out there videotaping this officer and he comes up to this officer and they have a conversation. He applauds the officer, this and that. And, uh, you know, I'll give the auditor some credit. I, I'm, I was happy that he published that video to show um, really who what I think was an exemplary example, a, a great example of police work. Um, you know, but it, it, most of the time, most of the time they're looking for trouble. OK. And if, if one out of 10 times they find an officer and they post a video, I bet a lot of times these auditors have interactions with police officers that go well and go friendly and they don't post it because it doesn't make for a good video. OK, I'm glad that he posted this one. I don't think auditing in and of itself is a bad thing. I think it can be a good thing. But I think it needs to be done in a way that doesn't interfere with police work in any way whatsoever. OK, because if you're inter interfering with police work, uh, you are you're you're interfering with the law. You're interfering with justice and the execution of the law. OK, but if you're just if you're just videoing and you're staying far away, it, then that's a good thing. Um, you know, the funny thing about auditors is less they're they're needed less and less. Um more and more in this country, police are starting to wear body cams, and they also use dash cams. More body cams, more dash cams. There's also, uh, we got cameras outside people's houses. We got cameras in municipalities. I mean, half the damn country is being recorded at any given moment, I would imagine. Uh, and, and, and it's only going to get, it's only going to become more so. Right. It's not going to be less is only going to be more. So the need for auditors is literally uh, going away, even while their work becomes more and more popular. And and if we're seeing that, what we're probably going to see is the auditors continue to be nuisances. Um, 
awesome. But, you know, I did respect the video that this guy put up. So I wanted, it was a little change of pace. So I decided to do a video on it as well. Um, there was an also video. I didn't get as many hits on this one. I don't know why. Maybe it's the, the coin. Uh, there was a sovereign more, there was a, a sovereign citizen in, in my city, this time in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I know I said that once before in a video and I was wrong. But if you go, I think I published about this guy back on uh, May 23rd. And essentially all we see when the police come in, we see this video, okay, is a gentleman in a truck. And he's got the Moorish flag. That's why I'm calling him a Moor. He's got the Moorish flag outside of his car. He's just screaming and he's surrounded by police. Now, here's the thing. We don't know why the police were in that situation, but this guy was causing a frantic panic, okay? And the police were being recorded, so they likely feared taking any action uh, against this guy, arresting him, dragging out. It could escalate the situation. They let this guy drive off. Is that the right thing or the wrong thing to do? I don't know. It's hard to say. Because you don't want to see you don't want to see people get away with breaking the law just because they raise a fuss, right? Just because they raise a fuss, they're going to threaten a lawsuit. We don't want to see that. We want the p police to be able to um, enforce the law. Um, now, you know, the problem is there's the perception that the, f the police aren't enforcing the law fairly, or they're using excessive force at times. Um, whether or not that's true or not, that perception is certainly exists right now. So the police worried about going, taking, t probably arresting this guy. They could have charged him with disorderly conduct or something. And I believe they went up and tried to give him a citation, maybe send him a citation by mail. Um, if the person had a suspended license, then the police should likely not allow him to drive off. I, I don't know if that was the case. I don't know if that was the case. I'm just putting that out there. Um, but well, I think we're getting to a point in this country, which is a little scary, and I don't know what the effects are going to be, where the police are uh, afraid to do their job, okay? They're afraid to do their job, or they don't want to do their job in certain places because they think they may get charged with crimes. They may end up with lawsuits. They may get their faces plastered all over the news, and uh, that's a problem. That's a problem because um, good police work has a lot to do with the reduction of crime across this country. So um, it's, it, you know, I, I really don't know what direction this country is headed. I, I hope that we can find a middle ground with policing um, and the police and, and policing can get better and the citizenship can get better. But I know we need good police and we need police to do their job. Um, we you can see already that violence is going up in major cities all across the country, all across the country. And uh it's sad. It's sad because we don't, we, we, you know, we as a people don't pray, protest. Um, I, I don't think we do enough to, to uh, show outrage over crime and violence. Now, crime and violence, if you go back for and I'm, I got this book here. Crime and violence in this country has actually been going down for many, many years. Read, this is one of the, this book will in a way change your life. I, I suggest everybody buy and read this book, Stephen Baker, The Better Angels of Our Nature. Okay, crime has been going down for a long time, and now we're starting to see an increase, which is uh, uncharacteristic of the major trend. So you have to ask, what has changed that's caused crime to go in this direction? So you know that video I did was just one example of it. Um, it's very worrisome. I agree that we need to imp uh, police. Look, police, the policing is the, – the government has a monopoly on the use of force. The government has a monopoly on the use of force, That whether it's the police or the army, right? The government is the only one who can lawfully use force, except in self-defense certain circumstances. And that's how we want it. That's how you get an orderly and a good society. But it also it, – it, it also means – that you should have, there should be a high degree of scrutiny upon the government's use of force because uh, government itself uh, can be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, it kind of depends on who's behind the wheel. 
But when the government has a monopoly on force, it puts them in a special situation where they deserve to be scrutinized. Okay, so if you are going to be a representative of the government and one of those people, whether you're a soldier or a police officer, et cetera, that has the right to, to use violence, there should be a, a, a special eye on it. We should look at it very closely and they should be held to very high standards. Um, but at the same time, at the same time, we need those people. We need those people in our country. Um, there's been very high levels of crime in this country before. Um, if you don't have the police, crime will go up. Um, a lot of drugs and illegal contraband. You know, America uses drugs at extremely high rates, run through this country. Okay, we need the police out there preventing crime and keeping people safe. So I, I truly hope we can find some sort of balance going forward. Police in Pittsburgh do nothing now. No speed limits, no stop signs. It's crazy. They, yeah, why do why they want to get involved? If they can collect their paycheck and not have to put themselves in danger, it's hard to, it's hard to blame them, right? Um, you know, if you guys watch my other channel, Joe the Lawyer, um, go. Thanks, Mila. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I appreciate the comment. You guys watch my other channel, Joe the Lawyer. I recently did a video on um, on uh, defunding the police and the broken windows theory of law enforcement. The broken windows theory of law enforcement says that you can stop larger crimes by cracking down on smaller crimes. Because when you crack down smaller crimes, you do a couple of things. You create an environment of zero tolerance. You create a more orderly environment. And also, you may be intervening in people's, like, so criminals will usually commit small crimes and then, and then, gradually over time move on to larger and larger crimes. This isn't always the case, but this is often the case. They do something small, 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 medium, medium, big, big, okay? And if you can intervene further down when they're committing small crimes, you may be able to intervene in a way that prevents them from committing larger crimes later. So the broken windows theory was used in policing in the 1980s and 1990s to clean up New York City. It not only does it include cracking down on small crimes, but it includes um, getting rid of graffiti, knocking down blighted buildings, right? So you don't have places where criminal people can congregate and just do drugs, okay? Uh, and, and creating that environment of orderliness also includes getting rid of graffiti, getting rid of, of anything that looks bad, cleaning physically cleaning an area, cleaning a neighborhood, knocking down those buildings, cracking down on small crimes, that can lead to an overall decrease in crime. Well, the defund the police movement, what's going to happen now is police are going to stop policing the small crimes, okay, and only really respond in very, very serious situations. But what will happen is because they're no longer policing the small crimes, you're going to get more of those serious situations because you're no longer applying the broken windows theory of law enforcement. I go into more detail. If you check out my other channel, um, Joe, the lawyer, uh, where I really get into that a bit more. Um, I'm not like some sort of scholar on the broken windows theory, but I've read about, it and I've always been fascinated by it. It, it. It's very interesting. So there's a link to my other channel, Joe, the lawyer, if you want to check that out. Um, so, you know, we'll see. We'll see what uh, direction this country is headed in. Um, there was recently, if you go on YouTube, uh, Vice, Vice, uh, which is like a news outlet, did a video on sovereign citizens and QAnon. Now, I've been on top of this for years, okay? Back during the, when the height of the pandemic, we had a woman, she was QAnon. I call it a QAnon mom. I did an article who um, she was arrested for a couple of things, but her her defenses that they quoted her include sovereign citizen theories and QAnon theories. And QAnon and sovereign citizenship um, really can overlap in a lot of ways. It's an interesting thing about QAnon is it can sort of put itself on top of almost a whole lot of different uh, conspiracy theories, but so can sovereign citizenship, right? Like, so you have conspiracy theories out there like, that say the Illuminati, right? The Illuminati 
Um, and, you know, there's this, this there's all these global elites who meet up every couple of years or every year and they run the world behind the scenes all right well sovereign citizenship feeds right into that sovereign citizen uh, conspiracy theory is very very flexible in those ways and for that reason it not only is it gaining steam but it's been around a long time it's stronger than ever and it's probably not going anywhere um unless me here us here at the common sense academy and all the other great channels like uh van bayon and Artie and schrodinger uh you know we do our part and uh virgo triad to expose these goons for what they are so um all right everybody raise your cup your glass in the air it's time for the same side same time tip i don't know what you're drinking someone out there's drinking mango pepsi which i also enjoy um i got here just the pepsi zero raise your gut your glass your cup in the air Cheers with me. It tastes better when we sip together. Cheers. Well, yeah, as FIL, um, there's a lot of so some people some people claim the broken windows theory doesn't work. Um, there may be a university that did a study that says that um, there's also uh, people who claim the broken windows theory does work. Um, and so we could probably look at any theory and find um, some competing, some, you know, competing studies or statistics out there. Um, personally, I think that there's something to the broken windows theory um, it was implemented in many places, many uh, uh, across the country, and we saw an, a decrease in crime generally. Um, you know, a lot of studies right now, there's people say, oh, mass incarceration, mass incarceration. I agree we should take a, a hard look at incarceration, but um, incarceration has also contributed to the decrease in crime that we've seen over our countries over the last 30, 40 years, even if it's only like a five to 10% uh, responsible. Um, you know, an increase in the security of, of items um, and things so that it's harder to steal has also seen a decrease in crime, five to 10%. And uh, both of those things relate directly to uh, what law enforcement does or doesn't do. Um, so I, I, you know, is there something to the broken windows theory? Is there not something to broken windows theory? I don't know. Um, you know, prosecuting people for committing crimes, I don't think it's going to lead to more crime, even if they're smaller crimes. Okay. And, and you don't even necessarily have to throw the book at people every time, but, uh, at the very least you can, um, you can give them fines or, or more minor punishments and I'll give you an example of uh, this. Uh, I, I did this in the video. This relates to broken windows. So, for example, oftentimes when the police are going, when the police uh, confiscate illegal drugs or weapons or other contraband, they're pulling someone over for some sort of, um, you know, regular mundane reason, like running a stop sign um, not having the proper registration, having a front headlight out. Okay. So the police will pull someone over for those reasons. And then when they make the stop, they encounter the driver. Number one, that may lead to a drunk driving arrest, get a drunk driver off the road. Or number two, um, they may see contraband. Uh, they may see a gun in the car. They may see drugs in the car. They could see the bulge of the gun. So a lot of traffic stops which are minor sorts of, of um, offenses can lead to greater offenses, greater offenses being charged. You get, so in that sense, the police are getting illegal guns off the street. They're taking drunk drivers off the street. They're getting illegal drugs off the street, all because they pulled someone over for a traffic ticket. Okay. And that also speaks to the broken windows theory of policing. Uh, let's say, for instance, the police stop someone for shoplifting and they pat them down and they find a gun or they find drugs. OK, so that leads to a, a greater charge and a greater arrest. So 
Um, I do think there's something to broken windows. You can certainly argue that the degree to which it has an effect. I do believe that it does. That's my opinion. Um, dun, 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 dun. Well, that's true too. Prison. Yeah. I mean, it, it, prison can be a school for crime for small time offenders. So we got to be very careful about who we throw in prison and what we do with them. I'm all, I'm all for rehab, especially for people. I mean, mental health treatment and rehabilitation should always, unless you're dealing with really serious or violent crimes, that should always be the first. That should always be the, the first thing we do with someone uh, as a society is try to get them help, try to reform them. You know, absolutely. A hundred poor, a hundred percent. Um, and pouring more money into those things is probably a good thing as well. But, you know, also pouring money into police and better training the police, that takes more money, not less. That takes more money. So uh, I think there's something to be said for that as well. Um, and we all know we got to get these sovereign citizens. We got to take care of these sovereign citizens. You know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, so thank you everybody for tuning in. This is Joe Palmetto, Joe the Lawyer. This is the Common Sense Academy. We're here just talking about sovereign citizens, the gold fringe flag, and the super class and the super elite. All right, Zephyr, let me I'm gonna click on this. Let me look at let's look at this page. All right, the super class. Let's see who's on the super class list and let's decide if they're worthy or not. Wait a minute. Super class list. The superclass list, Wikipedia. All right. In the book, Rothkopf writes that his list from 2008 contains 600 individuals. David Rothkopf says there are four key elements of success that unite the members of the superclass. and gives them unparalleled power over world affairs. These elements are geography, pedigree, networking, and luck. All right. Let's see what we have here. Well, see, he's including world leaders. I mean, you know, here's the thing. Like, do if 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 you if you hey Taze, how you doing? Yeah, is there are there is there is there a, a class of people that that has more power over everyone else in the world? Well, yeah, obviously. Um, this list includes world leaders. This, this this list includes Angela Merkel. Um, is she one of the most powerful people in the world and has incredible influence over people's lives? Absolutely. She's the chancellor of Germany. She's basically the president of Germany. Um, if you put the, you know, you, you get the, the, what is it? The G8 and the G20 together. Are they the 20 most influential people in the world? Absolutely. Do they have a meeting every year? Yeah. Is it, is, is it dark, nefarious conspiracy? No. This is how the world works. This is how society works. Um, you know, that's why I'm just not into conspiracy theories like that. Like, it's not a, it's not a conspiracy it's not a conspiracy if it if it's not if it's not being hidden, you know what I mean. If it's all out in the open, I mean, can can the president call up the president of France and can they make things happen that will influence and impact people for for a very long time? Absolutely. Uh, can the presidents and, and prime ministers of five or six countries get together? Absolutely, um, and make things happen for sure. Um, however, I, I think it's fair to say that power is more dispersed now probably than it's ever been. Because, you know, if you went back to World War II, for example, or World War I, okay, countries, um, nation states were more powerful than they are now. A nation state actually has much less power. So those, rule, those world leaders, like the United States president's extremely powerful, um, but if you ask me, I don't have my phone on me, Mass, right now. If you ask me, um, if you ask me, the United States president was more powerful 75 years ago. The rulers of countries were more powerful in the past because, you know, you're all human society. Human society is always going to be hierarchical. There's always going to be a hierarchy, okay? There's going to be people at the top, people here, people there, people there. That's pretty much how all, almost all biological organisms in the world exist, okay? And they're going to have ghost dealers, absolutely. There's always going to be some sort of hierarchy. So there's always going to be people at the top that have an incredible amount of power. Um, but I believe that in 2021, the people at the top 
probably it, some of them are still extremely powerful, but probably less powerful than they were a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago, they could make things happen and nobody would know this or that. Nowadays, it's much harder to hide things with cameras and cell phones and the internet um, than it was back then. And also you have, you have multi-state corp, multinational corporations that have a tremendous amount of power. And even the individual person can go online and start a YouTube channel and voice their opinions. So if you ask me, power around the world is more dispersed when if you went around the turn of the century, okay, in the early 1900s, around the turn of the century, there were about 15 countries that controlled all the other countries in the world, 50 European countries and some Asian countries had colonized or controlled every single country in the world. So then when you think about that, like take the British empire at its height around the turn of the century. Okay. Britain had control over India, uh, multiple countries in Africa, multiple countries in South Asia. Okay, the uh, point in time, Canada was still under British rule. Australia was still under British rule. I mean, the British crown, the British controlled, you know, maybe one third of the Earth's countries. It's not the case anymore. Power is more dispersed than ever. So those sorts of arguments that, well, yeah, is there a super elite class? Yeah, that's something that's always been and always will. You know, 150 years ago, all the kings of Europe, all the kings of Europe, okay, in the, around the turn of the century, they were all related. They're all related. So the Tsar of Russia and the Kaiser of Germany around the turn of the century and the King of England were cousins. They were all cousins. Europe was run by a single family at a time when Europe ran most of the world, okay? Nowadays, so, yeah, is there an elite, class, super elite class? Absolutely. Is there a small amount of people that have incredible influence over the rest of the world? Absolutely. But in my opinion, there's that power is more dispersed than it's ever been. More dispersed than it's ever been. And it, it's not a, a shady cabal. I mean, most of what they do is is you can see, I'm not saying all of what they do, but most of what, you, what they do is transparent. Okay? So... Um, that's just my opinion on the topic. Uh, you know, feel free to, uh, address, if you want me to address something, mass, go ahead and drop it in the comments. Um, I'd be happy to, uh, address it in the comments, but I, I don't have my phone down here. I'm not going to go get it. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I mean, the turn of the century, you basically had, you had a uh, great, great United Kingdom. Okay. The United Kingdom controlled dozens of countries. The United States uh, controlled at the turn of the century, the Philippines, Cuba, multiple islands in the Pacific, Puerto Rico. Okay. Uh, a lot of South America was sort of under our thumb due to the Monroe Doctrine. Um, so the UK and America are running a whole bunch of other countries. Then the Dutch had control, had overseas, uh, the Dutch had overseas colonies. The French had overseas colonies. Belgium had colonies in Africa. Italy had colonies in Africa. Spain, Spain had colonies all around the world, okay? Uh, the great powers, seven or eight of them, or nine or 10 of the European countries had ports in China. You know, the European countries basically ran China as as like a, a, a group sort of thing. OK, um, Japan at the turn of the century was flexing its imperialistic muscles, taking over areas of South Asian Korea, invading China, beating Russia in wars. Russia controlled a vast territory. So you're basically talking uh, the European powers, Japan and the United States ran the whole world and you could break the and the people at the top of those countries you could break that down to probably 12 to 15 people or maybe 20 25 people and half of them were related to each other and they had much more power then than the leaders of world nations do now okay power is far more dispersed 
than it used to be. Um, and in corporations, yeah, they have more power than ever, but power's going to fall somewhere. Okay, somebody's going to have power. It's going to fall into the hands of somebody. So um, the, the private entity, the Rothschilds own everything. It's trillion dollars that were related. They own the Federal Reserve. I, I don't. I, I don't know about that mess. Um, and uh, you know, the Rothschilds obviously have power and influence. I think it's vastly overstated. Uh, so that's that's just my personal opinion. And I have read a decent amount about it. Uh, so um, this, the March of the Sovereign Citizens will go on. And um, I will be here uh, to debunk them. Uh, is, is, thank you, CW, for dropping in. I appreciate it. Trucking COVID vaccine across the United New York State. What do you do, CW? You're driving, you're driving vaccines up and across New York State? That's fantastic. That's fantastic, man. Good to hear. <sighs> so those were the videos. Like I said, our, our legendary P. Barnes. We're going to do a video on P. Barnes. Um, invest in precious metals on any gold or silver. Um, no, I think it's smart to... I do. I, I will let you know. Um, it's it's sort of hard to invest in like large amounts of gold. Um, you know, you kind of you almost have to like buy gold bullion or buy gold items and keep them and store them yourself. I do plan on doing that to a greater degree in the future. What I've done recently, just like a little tip here, make things a little easier on you if you want to invest, is I bought stock in gold mining companies. Now it's still a stock, et cetera, et cetera. But if the market goes down, gold mining will go up. So it's it's a stock that's tied to gold. And so I do I did decide to start buying stock in gold mining companies. Um, and I think they're pretty good stocks to own. I don't own gold, um, but I do think it's a good idea to own gold. I don't know why you wouldn't. I think it should be a part of any portfolio. Um, younger people may not understand it, but you know, anybody who was around in 2007, we all know when the market crashed, gold shot through the roof for a couple of years. I mean, gold shot through the roof and in 2002 to 2007, 2008, if your stock portfolio went down, your gold value went up. So I believe personally that, uh, a percentage of every portfolio should consist of stock. Of, or I'm sorry, of gold and perhaps precious metals. What you want, 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%. That's personal preference. Uh, you probably don't want to go over 20%. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Tony Robbins. I can't remember. He came up with uh, what he thought was the perfect mixture of you know stocks, bond, and gold as far as your investment assets to hold in case of any um, sort of crash in the economy. I think he had like 15% stock or something. Let's look that up. Tony Robbins investment portfolio. You know, it's easy for guys like Tony Robbins to talk about. It's like, dude, you're rich. Like you're rich. You're super rich. And you're talking about, you're telling people what to do with their money. I don't know. Yeah. It's when you, you have more, the more money you have, obviously the more, um, the more money you have, the more options you have when it comes to um, investment. Tony Robbins all season portfolio. See, I'm gonna have a hard time finding it online. There are um, he he put it in his book Money, and I've heard him talk about it. You can find him talk about it in YouTube videos. But I think it's probably a good idea to have anywhere from ten to fifteen percent of ten percent of a portfolio to be in gold. Because what will happen is, um, all right, Mass, I love you too, man. I think I think there's a lot to crypto as well. I do, um, but which I think it's a good idea to have uh, to have a degree of gold, 
and of course, you know, stocks and bonds and and crypto is probably going to probably needs to be a percentage of a of a real uh, of a of a portfolio as well as far as an investment portfolio. Um, because if traditional markets get damaged, uh, crypto may in fact go up. Crypto may in fact go up if traditional markets go down. I could see that happening. Um, you know, the thing with crypto is I worry it, about its security. I worry about how secure it truly is. You know, they say that's one of the reasons crypto, you know, with Bitcoin and the mining that involved, it, it's hard to crack this and that. I don't know. Um, I understand it's a real thing, but can hackers steal crypto? Can hackers steal cryptocurrency easier than they can steal money from a bank? I would say probably. So I worry a little bit about, about crypto because of bad actors getting involved in it. Um, whereas I think you're more secure if you own gold, if you own stocks. But yeah, I do want to get into the business of buying, buying gold bullion. It's not something I've really done. But buying gold and uh, putting it in like a safety deposit box and just having it, man, because you just never know. You just never know. But going hard on physical gold, converting paychecks to it. Zephyr, let me ask you, how do you buy How do you buy your gold? Um, where do you buy it? Do you buy gold bullions? Do you buy gold jewelry? Um, I'm just curious how you get your bonds. Um, thank you, Led Zeppelin Werewolf Girl. I appreciate it very much. Glad you enjoy my videos. I love all my fans, and I appreciate you coming in and dropping by. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I love making my videos, and I love my fans. I love everybody, all my viewers who come in and support me. I want to do a shout-out. Andrea, Marie, Jonathan. Thomas, Michael, Art, Vandalay, Jacqueline, Richard, Pim, and Romantis. These are my patrons on Patreon. Love them all. Truly thankful for everything that they do. Um, all right, everybody. We gone for about 46 minutes. I'm getting a little tired, and I'm losing a little battery on my computer. Um, thank you for joining me, Common Sense Academy. Joe Pometto, Joe the Lawyer. I'm your host. We talk about sovereign citizens, First Amendment auditors, and whatever it is that is on everybody's mind. I'm going to try to get going every Wednesday at 8 o'clock. Um, check out my other channel, which you can find in other links. Um, get tons of links about the marketplace. You're going to get big into futures contracts. I buy from whoever. Yeah, but Zephyl, how do you hold that gold? How do you hold it? How do you hold it? Do you have – do you just have uh, – like you have an interest in it, like you're buying an interest in it. Yeah, send me some links, man. Send me some links for sure. This is my email. I would appreciate it. All right, everybody. Uh, my family is old French and have dealt in gold and silver for years. Yeah, I love it. I mean, I don't, I can't imagine, uh, and personally, my opinion, any good investment portfolio should include gold and silver. That's the email right there, newsletter at palmettolaw.com. Please shoot to that. Um, also, anybody, if you haven't already checked out, I know I got all these channels, but I do different shit on diff different channel. You know what I mean? You don't want to, you don't want to be, you know, I just think it's better to do different channels and, and to have uh, a niche, have niches. Like each of my channel, each of my channels fits a certain niche. Um, but my new channel here, I'm going to drop the link. Uh, I'd appreciate if everybody can go check out a video um, and hit me with a subscribe. Hit me with a subscribe, okay? Um, bu -bu -bu -bu. Yeah, Led Zeppelin, listen, I will. I'll shoot you an email. Da -da -da -da. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah, look, I uh, Taze, Taze, I emailed, I emailed Leto, I emailed him, and he said he would do a video with me, and then he never followed up, and I sent him a couple of emails. Um, I love Steve's show as well. I'd love to do a video with him. Um, so I'm just putting that out there. If somebody could email him and tell him to get in contact, if you guys email him and tell him to get in contact, uh, he may be more likely to do a collaboration with him, but. I'm a huge fan of Leto's Law. Um, he just didn't, um, you know, again, I've been trying to do a video with him. You know, Rakita got back to me. We did a video. 
Uh, I've been on a couple other channels. I'd love to do a video with Leto. So if you guys, you know, send him emails or let him know Joe the Lawyer wants to do a video with him. I'll shoot him another email. We had some communications. I don't know. We just lost, lost track or he got busy. Um, that'd be cool. But yeah, check out. That's my new channel, Tips from a Lawyer, everybody. Uh, I would I would truly appreciate it. Most of you guys are probably, probably already over there. Um, but I would truly appreciate it if people would hop into that link and give me a subscribe. All right, guys. Um, Taze, thanks for dropping in. Led Zeppelin, Zephyl, making this stream a whole bunch of fun. Love you all. Have a terrific day and a terrific night. I'm cool. <laughs> well, you know, we're all different. We're all different. I'd love to speak to Steve Lito. All right, everybody. Have a great day, Zephyl. I appreciate you, man. All right, everybody. Peace out.